Hello, Hello guys. guys. Let's start, start with, with the next chapter, chapter that we have here. here. That, that is geometrical, geometrical optics and microscopy. Before we start, let's, let's give full credit to Georgi Vereb, Miss Georgi Georgi Vereb. So she she or he, I'm really sorry, has made this slide, has made these slides very informative, very nice slides. Using this, I'm going to be explaining the whole lecture. So let's begin. Uh, let's, let's start, start off with Snell's law. Snell's law is very important. Snell's law is used to find n. N is something called the refractive index. What does it tell us? It basically compares the speed of light between two mediums. Okay. Let me draw and boom. Okay. We have a we have a medium right here. Let's say let's say I divide this whole. Uh, this whole section over here. This is the water. Okay, we have a we have sun here. Our sun. We have our sun. Beautiful sun here. Boom. Okay, and he's shining bright. And then, so we're gonna take a ray of the from from the sun. Let's take a ray from the shield. Now we know that this, let's say call this medium one, medium one, that is the air, and this is medium what the hell? Medium oh my god, two, that is water. Oh, I'll get angry. Okay, yeah. So now let's look at our ray coming right here, boom. Boom, right, right there. there. Now, now I'm going to teach you some basics. basics. Okay? okay? These, These are basics, basics for 12 year old Indian kids in India. India. Okay? If, if you don't know this, you should learn, learn, learn now. This is this. So, so a ray of light, light comes, comes in. in. The, the point of contact, contact from of the ray between, between the, the two mediums is called the interface. interface. Okay? And the, the point, point at, at which, which it it, uh, it strikes the second surface is called the point of incidence. All right. So, so this exactly is the point, point of incidence. incidence. Okay. okay. Now, now I'm going to draw a few things, things and, and these, these are like essential for you to understand. Let me start off by drawing something called a normal. normal. This is it's going to be there. Everywhere. Everywhere. Whenever, Whenever you talk, talk about lens, mirrors, reflective surfaces, refractive surfaces, a normal will be there. What is a normal? A normal is a 90 degree line drawn from the point of incidence. It's not relative to the ray. Okay, obviously you can see it's not 90 degrees from the ray. It's at 90 degrees with the point of incidence. Exactly. Okay? Wherever in, in, in the light ray is incident, the 90 degree, degree line from that. that. So if the, the surface, surface is like that, that if the, the line strikes, strikes like this, the, oh, oh no, 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 if the surface is like that and the ray strikes like this, then the we're going to find, find out what's, what's the 90, 90 degree, degree, degree line for this and draw like that. that. Understand? So that's, that's 90 degrees. degrees. Okay? okay, and, and that's, that's called the normal. Okay, this is called the normal. Now, what happens is, we, we get, get a few, few angles. angles. Okay, okay first, first let's, let's look, look at what happens to the ray. ray. Now, now I'm, I'm going to draw the ray, ray and then later on I'm going to explain why it is like this, like, like that. that. Okay. okay. Boom. Okay, and we get a few angles. Our, Our first, first angle over here, here, let's draw in pink, pink is this angle that is not 90 degrees. degrees. Okay. It's the angle of incidence, angle I. And the angle over here is angle of refraction. Notice, notice how I'm drawing the angles between the rays and the normal. Not, not here. Please don't draw the, ray, the angle here. Okay. Please don't draw the angle here, here. That's why we're drawing the normal. So please use the normal. And the angles will be between the ray the refracted ray or incident ray to the normal. This will be the angle. This will be the angle. Now, this ray, 
which is striking before entering the medium is called the incident ray. Incident ray. This ray right here, which is being refracted, is called the refracted ray. Simple? Now, you can see that my ray over here has bent towards the normal. Okay? It could have gone here, it could have gone wherever, but you see, it, 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 it bent towards the normal. What, what I mean, mean by bend towards normal? Let's see, if you were to trace this line, let's consider this line going undeviated. Let's say, okay, let's say what would happen if this line went straight through. That would happen. Am I right? That would happen. But what happened is it went like that. That bent towards the normal. It bent towards the normal. This is the normal. Why is that? Now, if you have a bit of sense, you will know that water is more dense than air. So, it has something called a higher refractive index. That is N. N2 is greater than N1. Okay? So, what does this mean? What does this mean? Okay, so this means basically that the speed of light in water is slower than the speed of light in air. Okay? So when, whenever that happens, whenever the medium 2 is greater than medium 1, the light, the ray bends towards the normal. But, but let's say the ray right now, let's say our ray right now is going, let's draw another ray, but this time, let's say that, uh, one second, let's say we have a torch right here, okay, we have a torch right here, and we're shining rays, boom, 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 okay, let's say that. Okay, and, and let's, let's draw, draw another ray. ray. Let, Let me take orange, maybe. Orange, orange looks, looks nice. And a ray, ray goes, goes from here. here. Now, the, the incident ray, ray is coming from, from water and going to air. air. Okay? So, so, if you guys can recall what I said about angles, angles so where do you think the angle will be? Okay? okay? For the, the incident, incident angle, that is. is. I, hope I hope you said here. here. Because if you did say, then that's correct. That is correct. So let me write that down in dark green. This is the angle of incidence. Now, why? Because the ray is coming from here. The ray is not coming from outside. So this, so this ray is now the incident ray. And let's see now how it bends. Now, if now we know that n one, this is medium medium. Uh, now this is medium two. L is now medium two. So let's. Let's change, change that, that maybe and write medium, medium 2 and this will write medium 1. Okay? So now, where do you think the thing is going to bend? If, if N2 is greater, if N2 is greater than N1, then it bends towards normal. Okay? But since we know as a uh, refractive index is higher, Therefore, Therefore, N, no, lower, lower, lower. it's, it's less than, uh, lower than, than N1, 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 then then it's going to bend away from normal. normal. Okay? okay? So, so let's, let's, let's draw it out and, and let us know, boom, boom. Okay? okay? So, so the ray is going to look something like, that isn't, isn't like the perfect, perfect ray. Okay. 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 So, so now, now what do you see? see? We, we can, can clearly see, see that the where did this go? Boom. This, this is being this being the refracted angle. angle. Okay. okay. We, we can clearly see R, R is greater than I. I. R, R is greater than I, I because it if you if, if this line were to pass undeviated, it would go something like that. that. But, but it has, has bent, bent away from the from the, the normal. normal. This is the normal, right? This, this is the normal. normal. But, but it has bent, bent away from it, and it has gone like that. So that is how basically the fraction in its very, 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 very simple terms works. works. Okay, okay that's, that's how it works. works. Now, now that's, that's how that is. is. 
So, with this, I hope you can understand. Now, let me explain what the N is now, basically. N is C1 by C2. What does this mean? C differs usually in physics to the speed of light. Now, speed of light, what this is trying to say is, for this is medium, this is N to 1. N to 1. Okay? Now, N to 1 is different than N to and N1. Let me explain. This, this one, one, when I was explaining this to one of my friends, they found it really hard to understand, understand this concept. concept. Now, nah. okay. okay. N to one. one. Let me draw. Okay. N to one. one. Will be C1 one by C2. C2. Speed, Speed of light in medium, medium one. Because it's a ratio. ratio. It compares, it compares what, what is the speed, speed of light in this medium to this medium. medium. Okay, in M1, I'm going to say, and speed of light in M2. Okay, but N2, N2 is different. N2 will be C to C2. What's just C? Just C refers to the speed of light in a vacuum. Okay? So when we say only N2, we will assume that, okay, fine. If it's just N2, that means it's not comparing two mediums. Okay, but then how do we find refractive index then? If we're not comparing two mediums, then we can't find refractive index because refractive index is basically a fraction. It's a ratio. So we need some standard, something that we can measure how much the light, the speed of light decreases in this medium, how much it doesn't. So what do we use? Let's take the speed of light in vacuum, that is only C as that standard, okay? So when we say only like, okay, refractive index of glass, what we know the speed of light in glass can be CG, okay? But what is, the, what is on top? What's the thing on top for fraction? Because we're not saying, oh, what's the speed of light uh, no, no, what's, what's the refractive index, index of glass with respect to water? If, if that, that was the case, then it would be C W by C G. That was C of water by C of C of the glass, right? But then when we say only, okay, what is the refractive index of glass? That time, this top part is not C W. It's C only. It's it's our standard medium of reference, kind of. Okay. So that's something that you should keep in mind. Now, now, another, another thing, thing to keep in mind is, when, when you write, write N to 1, you read it like this. The refractive index of 2 with respect to 1. Yes? And that time you write the C1 on top and C2 in the bottom. Why? Because you write the medium, it is entering from, to the medium it is entering to. So, so you know C1 is the medium that it came from. from. This is medium 1, right? right? So, so this medium, it came, came from the, length, the ray. So, so this uh, C1 is going to come up on top. Let's imagine, imagine it like that. that. And, and then, then the C2, two, in the medium, medium 2, the speed of light is C2. And, and this is like after the, after the interface. So it comes after the fraction. Imagine, imagine it like that, okay? This is the same for N2 as well. It's going to be just C by by C2. C is the speed of light in vacuum. I hope you guys know that. Okay? So, that is that. I'm just, that's how I explained. So, again, what is it basically? It's basically a ratio or a fraction. Comparing the speed of light between two medium. Why do we need this uh, value? Why? Because, uh, let's say, I'm building a lens. Okay, I'm going to build a lens. I should know how much the refractive index of my glass is because I have to know that, okay, if the speed of light is lower in, my, in the glass that I'm building, the lens that I'm building, then the light is going to fall towards the normal. It's going to mess up the way my lens focuses. So I should understand what my refractive index is and based on that, build my lens. 
Understand? understand? Yes, I hope you guys are understanding this, this okay? okay? If, if not, not, always you can ask me. Ask me. You can if you see me, ask me. This chapter I did in my high school really, really uh, much, much more in depth than this. this. So if you um, if you want to ask me, free to ask. And, and then, then what, what do you guys expect, expect N1 to be? be? Just, Just N1. N1. It, it would be. I hope, I hope you guys said C by C1. C1. Okay. okay. Now, now let's, let's get, get it. Instead uh, of using two and one, which would which, which could kind of be confusing. Let's say N of just water. What would it be? I'm, has, I'm, I'm guessing, guessing you guys, guys said C by C of water. water. Okay? And then uh, that, and now we say N of glass, glass, for example, would be C by C in glass. Okay? That, that is the basic concept of Snell's law. Okay? Which. Instead, Instead of using, using uh, C1 by C2 or the speed, speed of light in the first medium to the speed of light in the second medium, we could also find the same uh, value of n using this other way, that is sine i by sine r. r. This, we know the angles i and r. I hope you guys understood how to mark them. It is between the normal and the ray, between the normal and the ray. Okay? So you just take sine i, sine i, uh, sine i by sine r, divide them, boom. Okay? okay, that's, that's how you find Snell's law. In this example, medium two is optically denser than medium one, and therefore the speed of light in it is lesser. lesser consequently, the speed of light will be lesser in denser medium. Just imagine, you guys, you you, you are, are running in an empty room with a big room with like five people in it. Okay, in with five five people in it, a huge room with like five people in it. But then you run in that same room. With 200 people in it, it's going to be crowded as shit. So you obviously your speed is going to be less because you're going to be bumping into shit. You understand the concept, right? So you're going to be slower. Optically denser results in a slower speed of light. Now let's instead of keeping the minimals to the end, let's keep doing the minimals in between so that you know it's fresh right there. Now we have right here. Define the, uh, the, the the index of refraction. refraction. Define the, the index, index of refraction. That, that means the refractive index. It says over here, the index of refraction gives the speed of light C in a given material according to the following equation, where C is equal to C naught by N. Okay, now basically what they've done over here is they've taken N is equal to C by, wait, wait. Yeah, they've just taken C by C naught by C. Okay, n is equal to c. Refractive index is equal to the, the speed of light in vacuum, which can be referred to as c0, okay, c0 or whatever, by the speed of light in the given medium. Okay, and they, I don't know why, but they put this down. You like you're, you're defining this, so why would you put this down? Okay, so okay, understand this. You can write it as like this as well. You can write it as c. You can write it as this. I don't think that would be a problem. Where c0 is the speed of light in vacuum. Okay. You guys understand, understand that. that. Write this Snell's law of refraction. A light beam is refracted when it travels from a material with a refractive index of n1 into a material with a refractive index of n2, where n2 is not equal to n1. Now see, if we're traveling from air to water, air to glass, water to glass, water to diamond, water to this plastic bottle, whatever, we know that the refractive indices are different. And that's, that's the reason the light refracts, uh, light refracts in those mediums. If, it, if they have the same refractive index, then the light would just go undeviated. You know, it wouldn't matter for them. Then the light would just pass through. No, no deflection from their original path, nothing. It would just pass through. Right? So obviously, for the, lay, uh, the ray to refract, there has to be difference between the media, the refractive indices. So basically, the light beam is refracted when it travels from a material with the refractive index n1 into a material with the refractive index n2, where n2 is not equal to n1. Refraction is described by the following equation. This is the equation we just learned, guys. Uh, you can see over here n2 by n1 is equal to c1 by c2. Okay. Now, this may confuse you guys. Okay, because we know this and we know this. Alpha over here refers to i and beta over here refers to r. Okay. Now, this n2 by n1 may confuse you, okay? So whenever you write, you write n2 by n1, this basically means n2 divided by n1. 
okay and when you write uh, when you write just n2 that is nothing but n2 by 1 understand so if they've given us one medium they if, if, if they give us suppose suppose they give us uh the refractive index n to 1 is equal to 2 what is refractive index uh, of 2 something like that or 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 they give us refractive index of 2 and they give refractive index of 1 okay as the 2 or 3 and they ask us to find what is n to 1 just do n to by n 1 understand i hope you guys understand that so this is nothing to be confused about and this is uh, it says via alpha and beta are the angles of incidence and the refraction respectively c1 and c2 are the speeds of light in the two mediums that should be pretty easy this goes to microscope we're not going to do that now boom 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 okay now i want to teach you guys some basics about lenses okay i want to teach you guys something so let's cut this shit off right now and I'll next let me start with this let's take two spheres two circular glass spheres which are hollow inside or not okay but let's consider that they are not hollow inside i made a mistake that was that just came out not hollow inside two thick glass spheres and let's say somehow we were to merge them together like that which, which leaves, leaves us with this, this much area, area completely, completely merged. merged. Okay. Now, now what, what we can, can do now is, if we, we were to remove all of this part and all of this part, we will be left with a beautiful lens. But I don't want to do that yet because I want to explain to you a few, a few properties of lenses or characteristics of lenses. We have, oh, I'm sleepy. Okay. First, we have the principal axis. We have the focus. We have the focal length. We have the center. We have what else? What else do we have? I think that should be enough. Now, these two spheres that I was talking about, obviously they both have centers because they're geometric figures. They must have the centers. Geometrical sphere will have a center. And that center is like this, right here. Those centers will be the center of this lens. Okay? So, so whenever, whenever I talk, talk about, about, oh, what, what is the center, center of a lens? This, this is not the center, center of the lens. lens. This value is referred to C1 and C2 of the lens. Okay? This circle that you can see over here has this center. And this circle over here has this center. Okay? Ideally, you would want two identical spheres so that their centers are the same so that everything is the same. But, but that, that usually doesn't, doesn't happen. happen. Okay? okay? What, what usually ends up happening is, like, like you know, you, you can't, can't really make perfect spheres, spheres, but you can. can. If you can, then great for you. But, but that, that doesn't, doesn't usually happen, happen. and one, one radius is, is bigger, bigger than, than the other. other. Sometimes. Okay? okay. So, so now, uh, let, let me also, also tell, tell you about the radius. No. Let, let me draw a lens on this side. Boom. Mm. Let me draw a line going through it. Okay. okay. So, so usually in lens, lens diagrams, diagrams like, like this over here, you can see there's, there's going to be a lens, lens and there's going to be a line passing through the center. center. Okay. Now, now this, this line is called many things. things. It's, it's called, called the, the principal, principal axis, axis or the optical axis. axis. Optical axis. axis. Okay. okay. 
Now, now how, how do you draw, draw this line? Can you just draw this just from the center, center like that? that? Well, well then, then I can also draw, draw a line, line like that. that. No, 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 not like that. Like, like that, that, then going, going through the center. center. Or, or like, like that. that. How, how do I draw this line? How do I know that this line goes like that? Why can't it go from above here? Why can't it go from above here? You know? So let me explain. Now, let's suppose that this lens is the cutout of this lens. Okay? Now, you can see that these lens have their centers from their respective spheres. So, the line that I would pass through the aperture center and the two centers of the spheres, all three of these points, that's how you draw your principal axis. So, if I were to extend this surface of the lens and draw somewhat of what it looks like a spear and then i draw the same for this i know it's not the best guys but bear with me and this has a center over here and this has a center over here and this is the aperture center so this line passing to all three is the principal axis very important principal axis because we place most of our stuff on the principal, principal axis, axis to get, get the perfect image. image. If you, you want, want a perfect, perfect image, image, you place the object, object on the principal axis. axis. If, if you don't place the object on the principal axis, axis you're going to get some collaborations, which you're going to study about later. later. Focus. What's, What's the focus? focus? Let's, Let's talk about this. Let's, Let's draw a ray. A ray coming like that. that. Rays coming, coming parallel to the lens, lens surface will deviate and, and pass through, through something, something called a focus. focus. This, this point, point right, right here, here where all the parallel lens, lens uh, parallel, parallel rays pass through, through that, that place is called the focus. focus. Okay? okay? Not, not necessarily not necessarily that all rays pass through this. Only the, the parallel rays, rays pass through this. Okay? okay, so, so maybe, maybe you know you can, a ray coming at a certain angle can pass through this theoretically, it can. can. But if, if you were to pass a parallel ray through the lens, lens you, you can, can be a hundred, hundred percent sure that okay, this ray is gonna pass through to the, the focus. Now, how do you know where the focus is? You know, if you want to know, if you want to calculate the focus of a lens, how do you know? Let me tell you. If, if you know, know basic, basic maths, you will know that if this is the surface of the lens, the, the distance, distance from here to here, here from the center, the center is called the radius. radius. Yes? Now, now the, the radius divided by 2 that gives us here, somewhere, somewhere here, okay? okay? Midpoint. This is nothing but the focal point. Focal point or focus. Okay? So, so that, that is that you can see over here. Focal point. So, so probably the center is somewhere here. Center, center one. one. So, so we have focuses, focuses now. If, if you, you were to pass the, the, the rays of light from there. This will be our F1, F1 suppose, or this will be our C2, C2 no, F, F, F C1, C1. Or we can have our F2 and our C2. Okay? okay. So, so that we have now. now. <laughs> what else do we have? We have the center, center which, which I told you about, about centers, radius, focal, focal length. length. Focal length is nothing but the, the distance between the, the lens and the center. center. So, so that. Now, now comes, comes the confusion. confusion. Now, if, if I were to draw a line which goes like this through the center of the lens, okay, there will be a confusion for focal length, for center, whatever. Center we will know. Center is. That's not my phone. Uh, the, the center, center is nothing but, but distance, distance from here to the center because this is the surface which makes the circle. Okay? But for focal length, some quick people may ask, okay, is this distance the focal length or is this distance the focal length? 
Is, is it, it from, from the center, center or is it from the surface? surface? This is, is the, the primary reason why we use thin lenses. Why do you think we always, all, in one of the textbooks, we're all about thin lenses, thin lenses, thin lenses. Thin lenses. Why do we not like fat lenses? We all love fat lenses. We love. There's no bodily shaming here. Fat lenses or thin lenses doesn't really matter. What matters is if the lens were to be fat. If the lens were to be fat. Something like that. Huge convex. Okay. You can see that the distance between this and this, the center and the surface of contact is so far. It's so huge. So then when you're talking about the focus, okay, now it really matters. Now it really matters if it's this or this. Because now there's a huge difference now, right? So it really matters now because it's like, whoa, wait, is it, is it from here or is it from here? Be clear. Because, because these two, these, these two values have a huge difference, difference right? right? But, but in thin lenses, that's, that's not really a problem because it's like, okay, okay fine. Is, is it from here or is it from here? Is from here? Does, Does this distance really matter because it's thin, thin right? right? Now, now this, this lens, lens also is pretty thick. thick. Okay? okay? They're and usually way thinner. thinner. So, so thin, thin to, to a point where it's... it's like, like that. that. So, so the, the focus, the focus point, point okay, okay, let's, let's say over here, here. The, the focal length is just going to be like, okay, is it from here to here, here or here to here? here? Does, does it really matter? matter? No, it doesn't really matter. matter. That's, That's why it's, it's called negligible, negligible and, and people neglect it. So, so whatever, whatever it is, is, even if it's this center or from the surface, surface is the same. same. Okay. This, this makes calculations, calculations easier. This, this makes so many things easier. easier. If you were to just assume, assume that, okay, okay, this distance and this distance are the same. same. Understand? That's, That's the, the main reason we use thin lenses. lenses. Why do you think we've been using thin lenses? Why don't we use fat? Because of this. Because of this. Okay? So, again, so the distance so the, from, from here to here, here or here, here to here, here doesn't, doesn't really matter. matter. It's, it's a thin lens. lens. So, whatever. whatever. You know, you can consider any of the two distances and they're going to be the same. Okay. Now, I'm going to teach you two rays, just two rays, simple rays, so that you can understand how a ray diagram works. Okay. Let me draw a lens here. Let me draw it big now. Now, see, this is a fat as fuck lens, but it's not supposed to be this fat. Okay. bit lopsided is it not i think it's a bit like i have like this is perfectionism thing you know let me resize this just i want to adjust it just just to be yeah maybe brother yeah oh yeah okay i think it's still lopsided but whatever now let's draw the lens there first ray that i'm going to show you parallel ray which, which you, you already know, know like, like I said, said the, the parallel, parallel ray always passes, passes through, through the, the through the focus. focus. Let's, Let's say this was the focus. focus. There's, There's another, another ray now I want to show you. It's, it's called, called it's not, not called, called anything. anything. Uh, <laughs> this, this ray is the ray, the only ray, ray which passes, passes undeviated. undeviated. Now, now this Actually, over here, it's supposed to be over here, here center, center, but like I messed up the proportions, you know. So, the ray passing through the center, that is this point, will go undeviated. Undeviated. So, it doesn't give a shit. Okay? It's gonna go undeviated. Whatever it is. Okay? That's, That's uh, uh, one other, those are the two rays that I'm going to show you. you. Using, Using these, these two rays, you can form images. And I'll tell you how to form those images. So, so let's, let's cut, cut these out now. now. Also, also, another thing, another thing I want to tell you, I want to tell you, you is, is these rays, rays are reversible. reversible. What, what I mean by this is, if this ray wasn't coming from here, 
and let's say these rays were coming from here like that nothing at all would change they would be the same these rays are reversible very important point i've seen this mentioned in the booklet okay important now let's find our image let's say i keep the object over here boom let me draw one of the rays comes from the tip of the arrow all the time that is a parallel ray which we all know where it's going to pass through it's going to pass through the focus and then another ray passing through the center just like that boom we get two rays meaning that means our image is formed right here this is our image this is our object this is our image the image as you can see is inverted but it's a real image what is a real and a virtual image the real image the lens uh, the i mean the rays actually meet each other as you can see in this image the ra the rays of la light are actually meeting at this point hence they form a real image but there are some cases where they don't actually meet and i will show you those parts but a real image is most likely to always be inverted always be inverted like that okay always be inverted so as you can see it's inverted right now because obviously they they're not going to i mean if the object was here like this upside down on the principal axis the object would be formed like that straight but then compared to the image it's still to the object it's still upside down okay that's a real image now one important point okay we know the center of the this let's say this was the center of the the lens which we know if you don't know the center just go back a few minutes how can you not know you just learn it okay now it's going to be at the half point is going to be the focus i hate this shit i hate it it's going to be focus right when, when you, you place, place the, the objects between C and F, very important, please listen carefully. carefully. When, when you when, when you place, place the object between C and F, F you're, you're most, most likely going to get a real inverted image. image. A real inverted, inverted image, image, most, most likely. likely. Now, now, when, when you, you place, place the object between the focus and the lens, basically in the focal lens region, when, when you place it there, there you're going to get a real and upright image, which is magnified. Okay. Between the center, see it goes like this. There's this point. Okay, so the point is, as you get get closer to the lens, your image size increases. As you keep getting closer to the lens, your image size decrease increases. As you keep going farther away from the lens, your image size decreases. As you come closer, it decreases. As you go. So this is a real image. Let me show you a virtual image. Let me show you how to draw it. So as I said, the real and uh, our virtual images and magnified images are usually formed where, when you place the object between the F and the let's so let's place it there. Let's place it right there. Beautiful. Obviously, we know that we have one of our parallel rays. Parallel ray will always go through. So we just drawn the parallel ray. Probably want to extend this a bit more. Okay, and this goes like this. Okay, I'm just gonna draw it for this. And we have a parallel and the ray going undeviated through the thing through the center. Now, anything weird about these lenses? Uh, about these rays? You can clearly see they're never gonna meet. They're never gonna meet. So does that mean there's never gonna be an image formed? No. 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 You. You right there. You looking from here with your eyes. Okay. Oh my God. You looking over here with your eyes and your beautiful lashes. I have beautiful lashes. Everyone says that irrelevant, whatever. So 
You look and prepare. You're, you're gonna, gonna be like, like okay, fine. fine. I, I see these. You don't, don't see this. You don't, you don't see. see. But imagine. imagine. You're, you're gonna be like, like okay. okay. I, I see these two days. I can. I can see that they're not meeting right in front of me to form a real image. But your eyes are like a Newtonian computer. Your brain. Is an, an absolute powerhouse of a machine which, which, can, can, which can do millions of calculations in a second. And, and doing, doing this calculation it assumes a lot of stuff. stuff. Okay? Now, now usually the image formed in your eyes. eyes. Think, Think about, about this. this. Think, Think about this, okay? Always, Always the image formed in your eyes is a real inverted image. image. But, But your, your brain, brain is working in real time. time. Okay? okay? To, to invert, invert that, that image back, back so that your brain, brain can conceive it like that. that. Are you I seeing how, how crazy our mind is? So, so right, right now, you, you looking, looking at this video, video actually your, the image formed in your eyes, eyes is upside, upside down. down. So you're you seeing me upside, upside down. down. But, But your, your brain is taking the image, turning it upside down, down and then, sh you know, perceiving, perceiving it. That, that is so cool. Can, can you imagine that real time? How fast that, that is. is. Yes. So, so you, looking, looking at this then, your, your brain is so used to just looking at things and be like, okay, fine, I'll just assume that as a doubt. I'll just do that. So what your brain does over here is, is it thinks, okay, okay fine, this, this is the two, two days. Let, let me extend it. Let, let me extend these two days from behind. behind. Okay. They're, they're not perfect, perfect extensions, but... And, and they're going to meet, meet somewhere, somewhere behind, behind and, and an image, image is going to be formed over here, here which is a virtual image which is because they never actually met. The rays have never actually met. met. But, But we perceive them to meet behind the lens and, and we get this huge image, image when compared to the object. object. It's, it's, hun it's magnified. Understand? Understand? This is exactly and exactly how a magnifying glass works. You, you take a magnifying glass, glass you're like, like oh, oh do, 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 do. you're gonna look through. So, so you, you, when you bring, bring it from up like, like this, this and that, that you're gonna see the image inside, inside the lens is gonna go messed up. up. But then, then you bring, as soon as you make it close enough, enough the, the magnification, magnification starts, starts working. It's huge. Why? Why? Because, Because now, now the object is in between the focus of the of the lens and your eyes. They use, they see that the rays are not meeting, so they probably need behind the lens. And then it leads behind the lens and you get this virtual image and you get that virtual image which is magnified and that's how those work. So do the rays ever actually meet? No. So what does that mean? That means it's a virtual image. Halas. That was that. I hope you guys understood that. Now, there's this formula here that you need to remember because it has been asked right... Somewhere, where is this? Has not been asked? Has not been asked. Okay, then. Okay. But, but see, this is a very simple formula. formula. Okay, it doesn't, doesn't look very really simple, simple, but just understand it. That 1 by f... F, F being the focal length is equal to n minus 1 by 1 by r1 minus 1 by r2. What is this? All these values I'm going to explain right now. 1 by F gives us nothing but the power. The power is d is equal to 1 by F. Right here, the diopter is equal to 1 by F. What is this power I'm talking about? This lens right now, I say, when my friends ask me, bro, what's your, what, what, what power do you have? And I say, like, oh, I have 2.5 and I have 3. They're like, whoa, bro, you're blind as fuck. Like, you know, that hurts a bit. But then, what does this value, these 2.5 and 3 mean? They're basically D. That's what I'm telling you. That they are the inverse of my focal length, of my lens over here. And I'm going to tell you later on why they use lens. Okay, so, so the, the formula, formula goes like this: like n minus one. one. What, What is this n? It's the refractive index of this lens. Okay, minus one, and then this says r one. R one refers to the first surface, the surface of interactions. If you make a circle like that, the radius of this sphere of the surface that is the graph, that's r one. And then, and then R2 refers to the second surface, if you make a circle out of it, the, the radius of that sphere. That's, that's R2. R2. Okay. 
that's the formula now focusing refers to the action where parallel rays pass through the lenses and then they focus at a single point collimation is just the opposite of that rays of light come from a single point that is the focus and then they travel parallel to each other afterwards after refraction that was that image formation on thin lenses is exactly what i explained to you guys right now but over here you can see the i use the parallel ray and the straight ray but he's used another ray over here which is passing through the focus to go on deviate this is like a form of collimation okay if it goes parallelly it passes through the focus if it goes through the focus it passes parallelly they use three rays to form an image but two are basically enough you just need two rays to meet that's all you need to do okay and this is from the close lens between the focal lens i explained this as well one ray going like that through the focus one ray going parallel they meet like that understand or you can take one ray going like this and one ray that, that goes undeviated to the center like i did and then you get a ray like that so i hope you guys understand there is this formula over here as well this also referring to d so d has many formulas d has d is equal to 1 by f the most simple formula okay then d also is equal to n minus 1 by 1 by r1 plus 1 by r2 1 plus or minus plus only and also now d is equal to 1 by i plus 1 by o i is equal to object inner distance o is equal to object distance so since the image is formed here this will be the object distance again i said this and this are the same thing because this is negligible distance negligible and object distance refers to this to from this or to this doesn't really matter this is negligible okay uh that's that moving on healthy eye over here why do we wear glasses basically the lens of our eyes being the cornea we have two lenses we have two lenses actually in our eyes the first one is basically our cornea which is outside over here and then there's another the, like thing over here which is just the lens it does the function of what a lens does this over here our cornea is fixed okay if it's messed up it's messed up we can't really do a lot about it okay let me just come to so the cornea is fixed if it's messed up it's messed up but these inner lenses as you can see they're attached to muscular fibers over here which can contract the lens make it shorter or like widen the lens to make them make them even wider that's why sometimes we get eye strain because of the functioning of these lenses like that so sometimes the cornea is messed up how can it be messed up we can be either short sighted or far sighted what does this mean see ideally the rays coming from an object we want them to form right at the retina that is basically like our our our, our screen our cin our cinema screen okay that's what we want ideally to form right there so that our brain can perceive it like it is but sometimes because of the cornea being messed up the image is formed in front okay like that and this is called short sightedness short -sight i think short sightedness is a uh, when you can't see things which are super close up yeah would you when you can't see things are super close up so you can see the image does not even form on the it has this distance between which is not formed so this to correct this we use a concave lens okay which is going to deflect the light just a little bit okay this does opposite of what a convex lens does and then provides perfect whatever we need but then sometimes what happens is our rays of light form way behind the retina so what our retina sees is just two rays of light it doesn't see a point of them meeting it doesn't see that point so we can wear convex lenses which will bend the light in certain ways and then we get that perfect point that is hypermetropia so remember for what uh, type of disease what type of lens okay just remember that Lens aberrations I'll do at the end. It's not very important, uh, like very easy. So we'll move to the end. This image distortion, guys. This we know. This is image. We get an image. This is like a normal image, flat. This is pin cushion, guys. You have a uh, pin cushion like. 
it's like that Instagram filter where your nose is all scrunched up and you see, you know, it's tight. It's like, it's a dis type of uh, distortion where the center is way smaller than the other parts, the outer edges of the image. Then there's barrel, which is a very famous Instagram filter called the fisheye filter. This is the fisheye filter, barrel, where the edges, near the edges, the objects seem way larger than they actually are from the center. Okay, so yes, chromatic aberrations. Okay, chromatic aberrations are when uh, we pass a certain, we pass light through the lenses. We pass a white light, suppose. Okay, we, I can't really draw a white line here, so I'm gonna draw a blue line. But then the white light, what happened, ends up happening is it splits into colors. It's colors. We don't want that to happen. Like, of course not. Imagine you, you're looking at something, like your lenses are messed up. You have this chromatic aberration. You're looking at an object, and all you can see is like your you you can see all messed up colors. You're supposed to see white. You're supposed to see white, but you see all these different colors because it has separated now, and you're seeing this whole spectrum. And you think you're high now, but you're like I've never smoked anything in my life, and you're just confused. You understand? So you don't want that to happen. So this is not a good thing. You do not want this to happen. Now usually. You, when you pass through the prism, we expect it to happen. But what we don't expect it to happen is using when we use a lens. So we have to look forward to that, not look forward. You have to look into that so that you know that doesn't happen. Light is a refracted bend, refractive when it depends on the wavelength, red is refracted to the smallest extent, hence obviously. So all of these are refracted to different, uh, you know, extents, and then red is refracted the least. Okay, and then you guys just like, oh my god, I'm a high. That is image formation in a lens. Now, this is a very, very uh, interesting topic. So, wait a second. Only eat biryani. I'll come back soon. Okay, so now let's start with microscopy. Microscopy, first we're gonna do light microscopy and simple, uh, how a simple light microscope works. Let me erase all of this and explain to you. Now that I have talked about how, you know, I, I told you about a few lenses, how those lenses work, etc., etc. Uh, I told you how to draw some diagrams. I showed you some rays, like a parallel ray and a ray that goes through the center. So I'm guessing that this shouldn't be too hard. Okay. So now let's take our object over here very small object because we're magnifying it let's take a bloody frog's uh, uh, rbc so this is a frog's rbc okay so that's what we're looking at right now and uh, okay that's a that's a bloody frog's rbc okay now the setup is like this we have a lens here small lens first a huge lens here and our eyes looking at the microscope here. Okay. This is usually, uh, let me just, just one second. So this is called the objective lens. And this, the bigger lens is called the ocular lens or uh, let's just say ocular lens. I don't want to say them. Just so first one is objective. The second one is ocular. Okay. Ocular is the one just after our eyes. And then after that, okay. So let's take a ray coming from the RBC. First, we're going to take a parallel ray because you guys know. I hope you guys know what a parallel ray is going to do. It's going to go through the focus. And right here, we have our focus. Boom. Maybe I want to extend it a bit more. Boom. That's the ray. Then we take another ray going through the center. So we take another ray. Oh shit. Going through the center like that. It's going through the center and it meets right about there. Okay, so we can we can erase this. That's where they both meet. So now you can see we have a real image. Real image 
formed of the the red blood cell because because see it's behind the focus if you remember what i told you if it's in front of the focus it, we get an image like this behind which is magnified okay, and that's good for a simple magnifying glass that we use that's good but we are using as a, we're looking at a microscope now so we keep the object behind the focus now we get a real image which is slightly already bigger than the object okay which is see the object size is that much and that much already it's um, pretty much bigger now very cool thing happens a real image is when lenses meet now what do you mean by a real image a real image is basically like a projection okay so if you were to take a candle like there and then place a convex lens and then you place a screen over here you can see the flame on the lens if you never if you never seen it because uh, for me at first oh god bro just stop recording again uh cuz for me at first the thing was uh what do you actually mean by real image i couldn't really grasp the concept of a real image because i was like okay fine do you mean it's like a hologram what do you mean by a real image so it's basically like a projection if but the projection is only seen if you put the screen at the right place if i put my screen right over here then i see the projection if i put it over here then what do i see i just see two rays which are coming out like that and i just see those two rays if i put the ray if i put my screen over here i'm just going to see two rays if i put the screen right here i see a perfect image okay now the image being already bigger now this is a real image so the lens as so the rays actually meet but you see for the second lens the image is formed in between the f and the lens that means now what happens is look at this now what happens this image acts as an object for the second lens okay so let's take a parallel ray right here we're going to take one parallel ray coming from the from the real image and that's going to go through the focus and uh, boom and then we're going to take one going through the center just like that okay and then what we get now is absolutely insane we get a image which will this may not be the perfect extension but you understand what i'm trying to say right and you get this huge as image okay this is our final image and you can see when compared to the actual object this you think is huge cuz it magnifies not once but twice okay so this is how a simple light uh like scope works so i hope you guys just uh, understood what i'm trying to say the lens is going like this uh, first object is here gets its rays goes straight there forms a real image forms a real image because it's placed behind the focus okay forms a real image is already quite big and then this real image is formed between the focus and the lens so it what it does it the rays like this it forms a virtual image right here which is huge boom 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 that's how that microscope works now see the exist exactly over here taking the microscope in the conventional full view light microscope if you place a film or ccd or a screen whatever right at the point of them meeting then you can capture some things like this okay anything that i missed yes uh, i didn't miss anything but you can see there's this simple formula here called m is equal to i by o so basically means that over here i and o do not mean they do not mean the object distance and image distance which would be like this would be object distance and this would be image distance not compared to this cuz this image is this image is formed because of this lens so we're going to compare this for the image distance but not that over here we're comparing the image objects uh, size object height with image height 
so m is equal to i by o so image height and object height so obviously if the object if the image height is more then the magnification is more that makes sense okay i by o that's it that's just the formula that we need to know Applications of fluorescence in the microscope. Okay, obviously, uh, many of the cells in our body, they do not have an inherent color. Okay, some of them do, like we have plant, plant cells like chlorophyll and etc. They have color in themselves. So when you like shine light on them, they're, they're really pretty. But most of the time, we don't really have that. Okay, so what we can, what we can do is we can mark certain things like antibodies, proteins in our body with certain fluorescent molecules so that when we can we can do dark microscopy and then we get these beautiful dark dark images with like fluorescent blues and greens and reds and looks amazing so that is the application of fluorescence to increase the con contrast because the more contrast we have the more we can differentiate between different parts of the, uh, the particle that we're trying to look at Against the dark background, every photon represents a 100% increase of light intensity. Fluorescent labels can be found on almost any specific molecule. Most fluorescent labels cause no harm to living cells and are compatible with anyone. So basically, yeah. Over here you can see beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. <coughs> <coughs> so this is, see, this is them micro-injecting molecules or, you know, uh, the fluorescent molecules inside the cells. So that later on, when you shine, when you shine it with the perfect amount of radiation, they emit fluorescent photons, and then we can see them. Okay, so this is some of them like uh, GFP is green fluorescent proteins. So just some so some of the proteins that you can add inside the cells to mark them to make them super beautiful. This is one of the this is a sketch of the fluorescence microscope. Pretty simple to what we have. We've already done this in lab as well, but let me explain. There's going to be a light source with mostly all sorts of lights okay it's going to be white light with all wavelengths of lights there's going to be something called a condenser what ha what a condenser does is if light is coming like this it condenses it all okay it basically focuses all it's like focusing remember and if it was the opposite side it would be collimation but this side is focusing okay so a condenser does exactly that it condenses all of the rays just at that point and then we have something called the excitation filter now, Mateen's going to do uh, the fluorescence soon, or maybe the video is already up. But the excitation filter, what it does basically is it uh, eliminates all the other wavelengths of light, which do not excite the protein present inside the molecule. So let's suppose that the, the we added GFP inside a cell. So green, green fluorescent protein, which, get, which gets activated with green wavelength light. Okay. So this filter will only let green wavelength pass through and all the others it won't let it pass through. So now we have the perfect wavelength just to excite the molecules of the fluorescent molecules inside the sample. Then we have a dichroic mirror. Dichroic mirror only lets emission particles go through it. Emission. It has a certain number of wavelength as well. It's, it's like an excitation, excitation filter, but also not. So the... The filter, the wavelength that the dichroic mirror allows is not the same that the excitation filter allows. Understand? So the excitation filter allows the green wavelength to pass through. And then since this does not allow green wavelength to pass through, it goes through, bounces back and goes through the objective lens. Objective lens again does the same thing. So let's suppose all of the green particles come like this. Okay. They will condense all the way like that. Okay. So that's the objective of lens. Then what happens is the fluorescent molecules absorb their radiation. They become excited and emit fluorescent proteins, uh, fluorescent photons. Then they are, those photons will pass through because those photons have a certain wavelength and that wavelength can be passed through the dichroic mirror. So that passes through. Then there is the emission filter making sure that, you know, some of the, maybe sometimes the excitation filter can, you know, the excitation wavelengths can sometimes pass through. So to do all of the last step, it just has another emission filter, which only lets the emission wavelength pass through. And then you have us, the observer. So all of these rays will come like that. And then it focuses on to our eye. And you're just looking at there with your googly eyes. Boom. That's how a fluorescence microscope works. 
imaging modalities so there are two types of imaging modalities full field and scanning very important full field is basically you take an object a sample you place it on a surface you put light underneath it okay and boom, boom, boom the whole thing is illuminated when you look to the microscope you can see the whole thing at once okay it's the microscope that you see in school that you see in our labs when you look through them you can see the whole thing okay but for scanning microscopy you can't like look through it and be like oh, okay let me just go to that side let me look what's going on there let me look what's going on there no scanning microscope works in a fashion where like how a scanner works in a printer you know so you put a paper in and it goes scans the whole thing that's how scanning microscope works so you can't just look all around where you want okay it has to scan all of the particles first so it individually scans it by exciting the particles inside the sample so individually using a laser pointer goes on the objects like beep 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 goes all the way around scans the whole thing scroll thing then it's like okay boss image is ready you can see if you want image only ah not the actual thing okay that's a scanning microscope works these are some examples scanning can also be scm is an example okay scm tem which i'm going to explain resolution now we come to resolution resolution i see it's a different thing resolution is basically how small is the distance until which you can distinguish two different points i know you don't understand what i'm trying to say so you take these two points over here let's consider them to be two particles okay now they kept at this distance like this it's pretty small and the image formed is something like that See how blurry it is. You can't even tell if it's one point or two points. That is what you absolutely do not want. You do not want that. No, because if you're a if you're a microbiologist and looking at this, how are you going to know that this is two points, right? So what you want to happen is you want to reduce the resolving distance. What that is is basically let's say my resolving distance in a microscope that I built at home. Okay, I built this microscope at home. it has a resolving distance of 1 cm 1 cm okay so if as long as i place my particles away or away from this 1 mm distance i can see them as two different particles even if i keep the particles here okay still they are away they are farther away than 1 mm so i can be like okay fine these are two particles but as soon as they come and cross that boundary between that 1 mm boundary and they come closer than 1 mm i cannot tell that they're two different particles for me they're, they're one now they're blurry or they're one okay so what are, what would you ideally want you would ideally want your resolving distance to be super small so that you can even place the particles really really close but still they're away from that little distance of resolving distance so you can see them as two different points right that is what you would ideally want to create a super super accurate uh microscope okay so that's the resolving distance so that's the limit of resolution x the limit of resolution in the image plane is dependent on is independent of the magnification of the lens this doesn't this doesn't care matter the magnification of the lens doesn't matter what matters is this wavelength numeric aperture all the shit let me explain all of that now this is a huge formula here now resolution resolved distance or resolution distance and resolution power are two different things okay resolving power resolving power is equal to d resolution or resolved resolved distance is d small d okay and the capital d is equal to 1 by d let me explain the thing i'm so sorry for yawning so i don't know why i'm so lethargic today okay the small d is resolved distance this is the distance i was talking about you know that small distance the amount of separation until when you can like see them as two different points and then when they cross that distance they become like one blurry point that is the resolved distance d gives us basically okay fine if this is the resolved distance what is the power 
Now see, obviously, obviously, as I said, you would want your dissolved distance to be small as shit. So, the smaller this is, the larger this becomes. So, the more smaller the uh, D value is, the more resolution your camera has. Or your, not camera, your uh, microscope has. Wavelength, of course, N you learned half angle of aperture. This is something, half angle of aperture, we don't know. Let me explain this. So see, this is a uh, photon emitting rays or the or photons passing through a, a particle or something like that. Okay, you take uh, rays. They're gonna go from here like that, like that, like that, like that, like that, like that, like that. And that's happening, okay? But the rays that are going from here to here are the only rays which are effective, right? So the ray between the central ray, which is definitely passing through the object, and the farthest ray, which is making, which is effective, okay? That angle is nothing but our uh, alpha half angle of aperture, okay? We don't take the whole thing. We take only half of it. So understand again, the, the angle between the central ray and the, and the farthest effective ray is alpha uh, or the ha half angle of aperture. Okay, now there's a formula derived by this guy, okay, which tells us the limit of our resolution. The guy's name is Ernest Abbe. Abbe. Okay, uh, this is university. Okay. This was his formula, which this guy wrote on his grave. I love this thing which scientists do, which like they drop the sickest quotes and sickest formulas on their graves. I, I, I would want to do that, you know, even though I didn't do shit in this world with these formulas, but like imagine a formula being on your thing or, or imagine like, you know, one of those like Spotify things like they're like this and then you scan it and there's a song. So like, what if my grave has one of those and then you scan it and it's some sick ass song, plays, which is my favorite song ever. That's a sick idea. I'm going to do that. Okay, now let's go. Let's go to the whatever. Let's go to the formula goes like this. D is equal to lambda by 2n sine alpha. We learn all the values, what they mean. Okay. Now, n sine alpha is nothing but na, numeric aperture. Okay, we just make it shorter so it's easier to understand the formula. Numeric aperture, the proportion of photons entering the objective. Basically, the number of effective photons which are entering the objective. Okay, understood that. The formula now is what? Okay, the formula now is D is equal to lambda by 2 N sine alpha. But we know n sine alpha, this whole thing is n a, numeric aperture. So we get this. Okay, this is our formula that we have arrived from. Why do we have this 2 n a is the question. Okay, let me, let me see. Because we have two half angles. See over here. First we have in a normal, uh, in a transmission microscope, a normal microscope, fluorescent microscope. We usually use a condenser. And I explained this to you in the fluorescent microscope. So we're going to first have a half angle over here. Okay, that's a fat line, brother. Like that. We're going to have this half angle as well. Condenser, the rays are coming like that. They all condense like this. Okay. But then only some of them are actually going back over here. So we have this alpha as well and this alpha as well. So we have to take, take in, into consideration the numeric aperture of the objective lens and the numeric aperture of the cons condenser lens. So we take those two into uh, equation. Then we, uh, we, you know, we figure out that these two are roughly the same. So we just write alpha by 2 Na. Okay. That's our formula. To find what? To find small d. It's the smallest resolving distance. Now, notice this. Look at this. Wavelength is directly proportional to d. What do you ideally want d to be? Small d. You want it to be super, super small. Right? Yes. Now, this, that means, our wavelength, if it increases, 
D is also increasing. But what if we could have a super, super small wavelength and then we can get a super small D. Now, there's a problem with that. What if we use the normal light, which we can see visual light? Yes, that's from 400 to 750 something nanometers. The lowest we can go is 400, right? And even if we use like, you know, be like behind that, like there is a race behind that, which is like ultrasounded shit. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, that sound, that sound. I mean like, you know, gamma rays, photons, all of that. Still, what, what the thing is, it can just get so much small. How much smaller can we get? We want it to be super small. Okay, to get like the most crisp images ever. So, comes up with a solution is De Broglie. Our boy De Broglie, where is De Broglie? Did he not have anything? His name's not here. His name is here. His name is almost in everything. Chemistry lectures, all of the lectures over here. You can see De Broglie. So what did De Broglie say? De Broglie told us, if you remember from our chemistry classes, that everything in this world, everything has a wave function. You sitting right now, you're emitting waves. I am emitting waves. This, my, my favorite bottle, is emitting waves. My iPad is emitting waves. Everything is emitting waves. So that means, if everything is emitting waves, that means electrons in a atom should also emit waves, right? Now imagine an electron, the smallest thing that we know of. How small of a wavelength will that emit? Just imagine, it's going to be super small, super small. And that's what we want. So we thought, okay, fine. Let's gather a bunch of electrons and take the wavelengths of those electrons, the waves that the electrons are emitting, take those waves, and then what we can do is, with those waves, we get this super, super, super small wavelength, which gives us a super, super, super small D. And then if the D is super, 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 super small, then our what? If it's super, 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 super small, then our resolution power goes super, super, super huge. That's what we want. That's what we want. That is exactly what we want. So, we get that. We get it now. Okay, so let me just erase this. Beautiful. Now we have that. So, that is exactly and exactly the principle of electron beam. Electron beam microscopes or electron microscopy is based on this principle where you, where you take an electron concentrated on an object and then using the wavelength of that, you get like this extreme precision. Okay, now let's look at this image. Whatever. Now, this is an incoming electron beam. This is the particle that we want to examine. Now, go, when we come here, boom, we get this ray. Now, what happens is, some of them passes through, but some of them, what happens is, it depends on SEM or TEM. In SEM, what happens, we don't usually do anything with the particle. The electrons kick out the electrons. This electron beam is so fast that it, you know, in the nucleus, the nucleus of an electron, it, when an electron beam comes in, it kicks this electron out. So we get many backscattered electrons. We get many Auger electrons. We get many secondary electrons. We get, you know, cause some luminescence because some, maybe some of them gets excited and they release like some of this photons. We get some of the X-ray radiations. Maybe, maybe it absorbed and emitted X-ray radiation. Maybe all of that. What if we could like put a screen over here, okay? And gather all the information we're getting from these X-rays, from these Auger electrons, from these secondary electrons, from that, from that, from that, from that. And then using all that information, form an image. That is exactly what SEM is. SEM, let me look at SEM, is scanning electron microscope, okay? An electron beam scans the surface of the specimen. Damn. 
secondary electrons are released from the surface and collected by special electron detector like i said there's a detector the secondary current uh, electron current is converted into an image which appears on the computer screen and gives an impression of an outer shape of a specimen for better contrast surface can be covered with a material with high atomic number that is why why would you want a material covered in a high atomic number high atomic number means more electrons so when electron beams are coming more electrons are being kicked out that results in more information for the computer to result in a better image now oh whoa, 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 whoa. you guys saw my feed right there damn okay no <laughs> now let's look at tem tem is basically okay fine this has absorbed the electron the energy and then it has some you know inelastic scattering of the electrons some of them like just come the boom bounces off some elastic scattering inelastic being like you know it has lost energy the electron beam has lost energy and then it's gonna go but then sometimes electron beam does not lose energy and just, just goes away but then sometimes electron just goes mm, it doesn't even affect it it just goes boom okay fine i don't give a shit okay so what we get is now imagine we keep a screen over here and then we carry all this information then we get a tem transferred electron microscopy okay basically have you guys ever seen one of those uh, those hand imprint things those like let me try to uh those 3d printed hand no No, this is not understanding what I'm trying to say. I, mean, I, I honestly don't know how to explain it as well. It's like one of those... Uh, no, nah, what even is this? No, no, no. It's like those things, you know, with the small, 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 small spikes. So you put your hand through it. And then on the other side of the thing, you see like the hand just comes out. And then you can flatten it out again and do whatever you want. You can like put fingers or hands in it. And then on the other side, it seems like it's... I don't know how to explain it, guys. I hope you understand. So that is basically transmission electron. So the parts where the hand goes through is the scattered electrons. The, the screen over here, it picks up on it. Okay, fine. At this region, the electron has come straight through without losing energy. At this region, it has lost some energy. At this region, it has. So using all this information, it forms this clear, crisp 3D image. TEM forms 3D images, but SEM forms 2D images. Okay, guys, remember that. In electron transmission, electron microscope, beams electrons focus on magnet using magnetic lens. Emission information, same principles as in conventional transmission light microscopy. Absorbing power produces under 500,000 times stronger than the human eye. Because a vacuum is needed, samples have to specially be. Sample, a vacuum is needed for both uh, electrons, uh, no, both TEM and SEM. So no live samples can be uh, taken for SEM and TM, okay? Please make that, keep that in mind. And this is a solid transmission electron microscope. You can see, first there's this huge accelerator and an anode with a crazy voltage. So what happens is this is so positively charged, this anode, that the electron beam goes, oh my God, this is so positively, let me just run towards it. But then there's a hole in between, so it gets like, you know, aired. So it just goes like, Oh, I'm gonna go through an anode, I'm gonna go through an anode, but then it goes with so much speed, but it can't stop now anymore, so it just goes past through, and then it's, that's how you form an electron beam. Then this condenser, condenser lens, so the electrons are coming like that, it's gonna condense it, boom, 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 boom. Your object is here, and then you go, it passes through, you see another uh, lens, it condenses, and then there's a screen over here, and on the screen, you gather all the information, and then boom, you can form an image. This is an image. This is an image of a human hair using a TEM. Okay, guys, these are the minimum equations that we need to know. I hope I explained this to you. Let me look at the minimals now. What is the shortest resolvable distance in a light microscope? Approximately 200 nanometers. Pretty simple, guys. Self-explanatory. How can the resolving power of microscope be increased? Resolving power is what? Capital D. We know that is 1 by D. So let's look at what D is. 
d is equal to lambda by 2 n a. So obviously if we decrease the wavelength by decreasing the wavelength, the d will be smaller and the d is smaller, this will be bigger. By increasing the index of refraction of the medium between the two objects. Okay, increasing the refractive index. Why? Why? Because we learned d is equal to lambda 2 n a. But what was n a? n a was nothing but 2 into n into sine alpha. n is refractive index. So if you increase this, d decreases and that's what we want. d decreases then if d decreases the resolving power increases. By increasing the half angle, half angle is what alpha. So I just did the formula again. 2 uh, sine alpha into n alpha if it's bigger then this will be smaller then that's what we want. Boom 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 boom. What is numeric capital? This is the product of the index refraction of the material between the object and the uh, that's Na. Numeric capital is nothing but n sine alpha. Okay. So number of refractive index of the particle between the object and the objective and the sine of the half angle of the objective. Boom. That we just need to know this. Get the formula for the resolving power f of a conventional microscope. F I said we know that d is equal to 1 by f. So if you bring this up, we'll know f is equal to 1 by d. Okay, and uh, what do we know about D? We know D is equal to uh, lambda 2 n sine alpha. Okay, so that, 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 like that, n is the refractive index, medium between. We just need to write what these values are. What is the function of the dichroic mirror in the Florence's microscope? It reflects the excitation filter and is transparent for the emitted photons. Therefore, it separates the excitation and emission light paths. Hope you understand that. What is the function of the excitation filter in the fluorescence microscope? Okay, excitation filter is when you just, you pass light through it, but you just want the wavelength to pass through, which excites the fluorescent molecules. It's transparent only to, in, in the wavelength range in which the fluorescent dye can be excited. Therefore, it allows only those photons to reach the sample, which can excite the fluorescent molecule. What is the function of the emission filter? In the, uh, emission filter has the opposite function. It allows only the emission, emitted photons to pass through. Read this pretty easy. Remember it, guys. List at least three of the imaging aberrations in the optical system, chromatic aberration, spherical aberration, astigmatism, coma. Okay, now see the thing with uh, with aberrations is not a lot have, has been said to us about it. Okay. We need to just remember the names of the coma, of the chromatic aberrations and uh, non-chromatic aberrations. Remember the names, but I'll explain a few which I got information on. We have astigmatism. Astigmatism is basically when a lens has two curvatures. Now I want to dis. I want to show this to you. So I'm going to think. Let's take a uh, this thing. This is like a I don't know what. This is like a micro oven like cover. So this is the lens. Okay, this is the lens. This is a hollow convex lens. Now if I were to bend this like that, okay, you see. Up front, does it have a lot of curve? No, it doesn't have a lot of curve. It's almost like flat. But if you look at it from up over here, you see how much of a curve that has? So up from, from here, it has no curve. But here, it has curve. So it basically has two curves in one lens. So the ray passing through, it gets confused. It's like, okay, fine. What the hell? Which curve do I follow? What do I do? So you get a blurry, shitty image. Which you don't want. Okay? Then... A coma is basically light splitting up. So you keep your object here and your light splits up into its component wavelengths and you're like, oh my God, what the hell, am I high? Okay. Curvature of the field of the image, barrel shape and cushion shape, distortion of the image. That we learned about. Barrel shape, cushion shape, uh, fish eye, whatever, okay. Chromatic aberration, again, splitting of light. Spherical aberration is just when your lens is just shit. If your lens is just shit, if it's not spherical enough, then it won't form a proper image. So yeah. I hope that covers it up. Give the equation for the relationship between the image distance. This we learn, guys. Like, I don't know how else I can explain this. Like, you guys understand this, right? So, yeah. Give the definition of the SI unit of diopter. Diopter D is 1 by F. Okay. Again, do not be confused. Oh, my God. If you guys think diopter is the same as the D of resolving power, I will slap you guys. It's not. It's different. This D is different from the other D. 
Oh, oh, the true Ds? No, do you know what they mean? This is D for the diopter thing. And this is the D for resolving. Okay, they're not equal, guys. Not equal. Please don't be confused. Okay. It is the refractive index of the power. Okay, so it's just one me one by one by m. Please understand this, guys. Like if you honestly, if you don't understand it, guys, like just feel free in the comment to be like, okay, you did not explain this. Make another video. I'll make probably like a short if you want. Like one of those TikTok things on YouTube. And I'll explain this concept in like one minute. If you want, I'll actually do that to you. Uh, for you, okay? Uh, what are the two discoveries that made the construction of an electron microscope possible? Uh, an electron can be regarded as a wave and its wavelength only a fraction of the wavelength of visible light. Okay, like I told, once we figured out that everything has a wave, we figured, okay, fine, what, what is the thing that can give us the smallest wave? And we're like, okay, fine, electron can give us the smallest wave, so we use that. An electron beam can be focused with magnetic field. Yeah, when we figured out that an electron beam can be focused by passing it through a magnet, that's when we were like, yeah, we should build an electron microscope. List at least three signals that can be detected during an electron microscope. Electron microscope. Okay, fine. So this is the things that I told you about. Backscattered electrons, secondary electrons, characteristic X-rays, observed electrons, absorbed electrons, cathode luminescence. You just need to remember these. You, know? you just need to like by heart them. You need to remember them. I can't like explain these concepts. You what? There's no even. There's not even any concepts in this. Okay. What are the two types of electron microscopes, guys? Come on. What is the principle of transmission electron microscopy? A thin, typically 100 nanometer thin sample is illuminated with an electron beam. The sample scatters a fraction of the electrons. The sample usually does not absorb the electrons using magnetic lens. An image is formed from the electrons going across the sample. This is my adjective. The image is characteristic of the electron scattering properties of the sample. Transmission electron microscopy, you just see, you know, okay, fine, this electron is scattered this much. This electron has lost energy. This electron has not lost energy. This electron has passed through. So let's using all this information, make an image. That's basically it. Remember this, 100 nanometer thick and all. What is the principle of scanning electron microscopy? It's simple is scan. The sample is scanned by a, sing, uh, by a thin electron beam. Uh, secondary electrons introduced by the electron beam are detected on a pixel by pixel basis. So you take a whole sample, you focus electron beam here. Secondary electrons are emitted, you catch that in a detector. Then you go here uh, with the electron beam. Secondary electrons are emitted, catch that on the sensor. Then you go here. Then you go here. Then you go here. Then you go all over the thing to form a 2D image. So that covers it all. That is optics. Guys, again, always I'm telling you, feel free to bash me in the comments if I've done anything wrong. If you want me to explain anything uh, which you didn't understand, I, I'm really, really down to make like shots. So I'll just make like a small TikTok type of thing and be like, this is that, this is this, okay? If you guys don't understand, feel free to ask me, feel free to critique me. If you guys feel like the channel's not doing something, you know, maybe unprofessional. I'm trying to keep it very chill, guys. I want, I want it to seem like when you watch my videos to be like, you know, oh, you're just talking to a friend and I'm explaining it to you over like a Zoom call or something like that. So I'm trying to be really chill with you guys. Yeah, don't uh, take it as me trying to be unprofessional or trying to be like, you know, are trying to act like I don't care. Yeah. So that was that guys. Uh, please after this go through the uh, book uh, the booklet as well. Oh my God, I'm stuttering so much today. Go through the booklet as well. And yes, we will do good in the SCT. Study hard guys. I love you guys. See you in the next video.